Hey people, Mark here, and today we're covering one of the most recognizable groups of ships in the Halo universe. Among the most powerful vessels in the modern galaxy, the Covenant's carriers are, to many, the face of the Covenant. This was at first just meant to be about the various CAS-class assault carriers, but I decided why not delve into the rest of the carrier dynasty of the Covenant, and its splinter groups and different factions. We'll start with the CAS classes, but first, sorry guys, you know how this works. Please subscribe to this and the other channel, which is very dear to my heart. I'll make sure to put up the most gaudy and obnoxious noxious subscription graphic I can find. There. Feeling manipulated? Cool. Onward. Like the video. Covenant assault carriers are essentially a Covey fleet's doting mom. They held the fleet's food supply, religious figures, and assembly forges necessary to keep a fleet fighting as long as possible before a full resupply was needed. Quick aside, no wonder the Covenant was winning, every fleet was led by one to three Spirit of Fires. Anyway, in direct contrast to the Sonaris pattern heavy destroyer, the crews of the Covenant assault carriers had already proven themselves to be of a more worthy and honorable ilk than the usual Covenant warriors. As such, they no longer need to chase glory to further their state and they can focus on serving their covenant. With their absurdly large point defense armament and fighter complement, they clear the battlefield of fighters, small craft, and enemy picket ships and other small stuff like that, while the shipmasters of vessels like destroyers, cruisers, or corvettes secure the honor of victory against threats more worthy of attention. This is why they can keep their focus on those smaller threats I mentioned earlier. Measuring in at 5,347 meters with a mass of 2.7 billion tons, Jesus Christ, all of the CAS-class assault carriers were a few hundred meters shorter than the Infinity, but twice as massive. That is to say it has more mass, I realize that was not clear. Even if that doesn't make physical sense, which I'm not an engineer so I have no clue, it somehow sounds about right, because the Covenant were not what one would describe as efficient. Like all Covenant warships and lots of heavy equipment, they run on an extremely powerful deuterium-tritium pinch fusion reactor, as well as two secondary reactors. They're constructed within and without with nano-laminate plating, they're outfitted with the Covenant's marginally more powerful and accurate borer slipspace drives, and are propelled by rear-facing gravity generators called repulsor engines. In the Carol's case, we know the repulsor engines are of the Raffius pattern, and the borer drive is of the Primus pattern. All Covenant CAS-class carriers are, of course, energy shielded. The presence of at least one CAS-class would be the staple of the Covenant's large fleet actions throughout the Human Covenant War, and afterward they would be particularly prized by the Covenant remnant groups, due probably to the destruction of High Charity. As we discussed in what are Covenant design patterns, large ships like the CAS are constructed in the Covenant's primary assembly forges, the largest assembly forges available. The thing is, for the most part, High Charity is the only place we know of to have these massive factories. Now, the planet Song of Victory was a Covenant colony known to be the birthplace of the Shadow of Intent, which was a particularly powerful Carol pattern assault carrier, but the status of that world after the war and after the Great Schism is unknown. With High Charity gone, very few factions can manufacture these ships anymore, which is, uh, this is somewhat speculation I should say, why the Sangheili made the switch to heavily armed merchant ships like the Karak Cruiser and Bigantine carriers. Very few UNSC ships can stand up to Covenant carriers. The only thing we could assume could even approach them on even-ish footing during the war would have been the Punic class supercarrier, which we know could stand up to Covenant ships consistently. Even then, I don't like the Punic's chances of surviving consecutive engagements after facing one, let alone fighting two at a time. They'd be looking at massive damage and destruction in most cases. I like the Epoch class heavy carrier's chances even less, and as for cruisers, uh, look at this clip I show at least once per video. The Siphon Pattern Examiner, as it was known by the Covenant, was the most commonly seen variant of the Covenant Assault Carrier. These would be closely associated with the sight of a freshly glassed world, or an arriving fleet that would spell doom for any human colony in a system. Siphons, like the Murin Pattern agricultural ships, have large nature preserves on board where animals are hunted to feed the crew. But these preserves no doubt also just served as a quality of life feature. It's basically like having a giant national park on your spaceship. Pretty sick. 
And honestly, that is all we know in specific about the siphon pattern assault carrier that differs in any meaningful way from the Carol pattern, which is a shame, because in my opinion, the siphon looks way better. I know Halo 2 Anniversary's models are going to have better textures than Halo 3, obviously, but just the design, the way the silver is more of a white, how it has these skyscraper-looking protrusions on top but still maintains its curves, like if the Covenant built an Executor-class Star Destroyer or something. The siphon just makes that silvery white color work for it. Normally, I prefer the deeply purple Covenant ships, like the, the gray Ket patterns, they just really, I don't like that, but damn, it would be remiss of me not to take notice that the siphon just really works that shit. Anyway, the Carol pattern has a lot more info to discuss. Far rarer than the siphon, this variant could only be built with the Hierarch's explicit blessing. Not just a prophet, but one of the three big boys themselves. The main visual difference, aside from the textures, because I think I think canonically the Carol would look closer to the siphon we see in 2 Anniversary, but Halo 3 is so goddamn old, is the big lump we see in the rear. The Carol pattern is also rounder on top and doesn't have those skyscraper looking things that I mentioned earlier. The Carol pattern, and the siphon probably as well, has an internal bridge in an armored pod supported by several redundant energy shields and inertial dampeners to keep significant shockwaves from affecting the superiors. Nearby is the Blade Master's Yard, a place where Sanghili sword masters train and hone their art using ancient rituals. The hanger of the Carol pattern has to be large enough to fit its absolutely huge complement, which we'll get into. If you never knew, as I didn't until this year, this scene from Halo 3 takes place within the hangar of the Shadow of Intent. Much like a human supercarrier, CAS classes can carry human frigates, although even the Punic had to have them underslung externally. Looks like there's room to spare in this case, not to mention this is just one of eight hangar bays. A fully staffed Carol pattern would have 200 superiors, basically naval officers, and 10 engineers. This is an inordinate amount of Hiragak for one ship, but due to the ship's guaranteed close proximity to at least one hierarch, they would feel more comfortable allowing this, I assume. It's probably one of the highest honors to be able to serve on one of these ships. A ship personally serving one of the most holy individuals in the entire Covenant, given the best amenities and tools to carry out your work. Those 200 superiors would have proven themselves time and time again to earn a place here, so one could expect a Carol pattern to be staffed by extremely experienced and skilled crew, even compared to their siphon pattern counterparts. Shipmasters the likes of Artas Vadu filled these ranks. It also explains why in this scene, Vadum, shipmaster of the Carol Pattern Assault Carrier Shadow of Intent, was able to have a personal audience with the Hierarchs themselves. He's no mere shipmaster. He's one of the most trusted and accomplished individuals in the entire Covenant, and so he was given a command of a fitting vessel. Something you might not know about the Carol Pattern is its ability to completely separate its bow from its stern thanks to modular dispersal technology. This was first developed by the Forerunners as a tactic to use when boarded by the Flood. Parasite gets on board, detach the section and any biomass within it. These ships are constructed in a decentralized fashion so, like an evolved version of the Halcyon's honeycomb structure, the ship can function with a minimized loss in functionality after losing a large amount of its structure, whether intentionally detaching it or as a result of heavy damage. The ground complement of a Carol pattern is huge, but not as varying as you might expect, including 40,000 warriors, 700 ghosts, 196 wraiths, 44 shadows, and up to 3 scarabs. Most of the complement space is allocated to its gigantic air wing, which holds within it 250 insertion pods of likely varying type, 44 spirits or phantoms, 20 tick boarding crafts, 64 seraphs, 192 space banshees, and 600 atmospheric banshees. They also carry some amount of Ren shuttles, which I forgot to include in the Every Covenant Ship video. The Carol also has something called Habitat Domes, which I assume are a grander version of the methane suites reserved for grunts found on many other Covenant ships and perhaps some other atmospheres for other species to give them a more comfortable experience or maybe just like an arboretum or something. The Siphon and Carol Pattern Assault Carriers have an identical armament, although due to the exclusive nature of Carol Patterns, I imagine they probably have a lot of variance from ship to ship, perhaps a lot of customization by shipmasters or even the hierarchs themselves. The first and last weapon most individuals see in action on the CAS class is the Infernus Pattern Super Heavy Excavation Beam. This would, alongside the Sonaris Pattern Heavy Destroyer, be doing most of the glassing on enemy planets.
And while we're on the topic, I feel the need to clear something up I mentioned in the Sonaris Pattern Heavy Destroyer video, wherein I said many shipmasters viewed the work as distasteful or beneath them, failing to see the honor in squashing bugs. This was an extrapolation from my spotty recollection of the words Fleet Master Nizat Kavarosi said in Chapter 9 of Halo Silent Shadow, Silent Shadow, Silent Storm, where he thinks to himself, it seemed a cruel way to set one on the path to oblivion, this rain of fire that devoured all it touched that burned bone and boiled stone and turned dirt to glass. Yet so glorious was the bombardment, so magnificent the white lances blossoming upon the nomadic villages below, so sublime the scarlet rings dilating across the smudges of green pasture, that Nazat Kovarosi could not turn from the sight. So yeah, I was referring to the more honorable shipmasters and fleet masters even then, but it was less of a dislike for glassing and more of a preference for actual combat, as a species that loves honor. They just, they can't get enough of it. And for that actual combat, the primary weapons of the CAS class are their two Erpion pattern super heavy plasma lances. Plasma lances are the most powerful naval weapons the Covenant has. Well, maybe, we'll get into that later. The largest variant of their common plasma beam emitters, they are a force to be reckoned with for any ship in the galaxy, slicing through the UNSC's titanium plating like butter. And the Erpion pattern super heavy plasma lances are, as far as we know, the most powerful variant that exists, able to completely obliterate a marathon class heavy cruiser one of the most powerful human ships ever built, in what appears to be, based on the light being emitted behind the cruiser, five seconds flat. It's not really known how much range affects functionality, but these are plasma lances firing matter with mass, not lasers shooting photons. Not to mention plasma in the Halo universe behaves differently than examples of the stuff in real life, so I don't know. Based on the close range nature of Halo's naval engagements, I'm gonna assume these are very close range implements, which complements the Elite's honor-seeking nature, as well as gives an explanation as to why the Covenant can't just delete every human ship and world from a million billion miles away. Six Luxor pattern heavy plasma beam emitters. These are some smaller plasma beams, but do not be fooled, they should be avoided just as fervently. Plasma beam emitters are plasma beam emitters. 24 Mictix pattern heavy plasma torpedo silos. These are the Covenant's answer to missiles. They blast through armor with the added pros of being less power intensive and being guided for those more nimble bogies like corvettes or destroyers or frigates, although those would be just as susceptible to plasma beams if they aren't careful. For even more agile opponents like fighters, the carriers employ 700 ferial pattern pulse lasers for point defense. I am a huge proponent of using lasers in sci-fi for point defense. They don't need ammo, they have way more range than ballistic weapons, their velocity is the speed of light, and they're super cool. This armament rarely failed to put UNSC fleets into the dirt, like the barbarian infidel cretins they were, falling like freshly mown grass before the elegant and all-encompassing might that is our holy covenant. Sorry, I got into the vibe. And the final pattern of apparent CAS class carrier that we know of is one that we don't know of. The unidentified assault carrier from Halo Reach has to this day never been identified, despite appearing extremely frequently throughout the game and reappearing in Halo Infinite with controversy included. And it even exists in the Silver Timeline! Whoa! Anyway, the thing about this ship is, despite its low resolution model that wasn't quite meant to be seen up close, it looks awesome. You know how my big gripe with the Carol is that it doesn't make the gray work for it like the Siphon does? I love, just love, that the unidentified carrier, dubbed the Esgem pattern by the community, just says fuck it, and not only makes the ship purple, makes it purple as hell, and glow. The black accents are also a super interesting addition, and though we have no measurements for this thing, I'm guessing it's either shorter than the others, or just as long and significantly wider. In any case, all we really know about this thing is that the shield can effectively ignore a blow from the Mulsan's bright and they were present in force in the Fleet of Particular Justice in the Fall of Reach, and one was present during the Battle of Sigma Octanus IV alongside a siphon pattern. Hey people, editing Mark here, and I actually forgot to talk about in the main recording of this video what controversy this was a part of that uh, I brought up earlier. So basically, if y'all remember Sins of the Prophets, I always credit them with whatever images I use in my description, and I've brought them up multiple times. The, the team behind Sins of the Prophets is Choke Point Games, we all know this. I've brought it up many times, go play Sins of the Prophet, but 
anyway, there was this model that they made for the SGEM pattern, the fan, the, the fan version of this carrier that uh, appears in Halo Reach. The model made by Jared Harris was featured in Halo Infinite uh, without their knowledge, and they didn't have an issue with this. Obviously, 343 and Sins of the Prophets, they work together uh, pretty often, but I uh, just thought I should touch on that, you know. The fundamental problem with this being, you know, the lack of creditation. Cre a, a credit, a cre credit, it didn't give credit. To be clear, they did remedy this. They, they gave credit. Also, look at this. This is the Sins of the Prophets version of the, uh, the unidentified carrier. Although, I guess now that it's featured in Halo Infinite, that just kind of makes this the canon Mo God damn it. This is the canon model for the unidentified carrier. And it uh, doesn't it just look awesome. It just looks amazing. There is one problem. Uh, this light, it should be purple because purple's a better color than any other color. But that, you know what? It, 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 nitpicking. It's a great, great model. It's an amazing model. It's just not purple enough. But it is an amazing model. It's, it's just not purple enough. Lursu pattern brigantines are old, really old. So old they were only brought back into military service out of dire necessity. Built sometime before 938 BCE, the Lursu pattern brigantines are vested ships made by the elites before joining the Covenant. Measuring in at 6,367 meters or 20,889 feet and measuring 2.3 billion tons, these ships dwarfed a lot of the largest Covenant ships and I think are the third largest Covenant ship class we know of. We will be talking about the two other ones later. A lot of that extra girth is probably old tech that the elites don't know how to make compact, as at the time they refused to reverse engineer Forerunner tech. Even before meeting the Prophets, they worshipped that stuff and saw taking it apart as blasphemy. So in reality, while yes, they'd have Forerunner tech to observe and test, to what extent we don't know, they created the Vested Ships, which we'll talk about at length at another time, before ever reverse engineering any Forerunner tech. This is nuts. The humans wouldn't leave Earth for another 3,015 years, and they already built ships that could stand up to the infinity if used correctly. Reclaimers who? Anyway, I did make a short a while back talking about why I think this occurred. Basically boils down to the fact that the Didact nerfed humans a long time ago, but that's not the point of this video. Back on topic. Lursus were relegated to merchant tithe fleets once more powerful ships entered service within the Covenant. Shipping, resources, money, personnel, anything that needed to be moved from one place to another, far behind friendly lines. The worst they would have had to worry about at that time would have been jackal pirates or perhaps banished raids after 25 549. Another quick side note, I really want to see a banished fleet with a mix of their own dedicated ships like Carves and Dracars and Dreadnoughts mixed in with Covenant ships like the CCS class battlecruisers and such, and why not throw in some old Sangheili ships with banished colors? They'd make use of them for sure if they had them. I think a more hodgepodge looking fleet would suit them well. Anyway, they'd be seen in those tithe fleets alongside the Covenant's other weaker or older ships, also being used as ferries for pilgrimages and the like. Some other ships in those fleets include the Auser pattern frigates, Karak cruisers, Acton pattern escorts, liches, and Xanar pattern light cruisers. The Lursu pattern brigantines were brought back into active military service following the Great Schism. With the loss of high charity and the splintering of the Covenant, the Sangheili lost a lot of their former political and industrial power. With a much decreased ability to produce new ships, they re-repurposed their older ships and upgraded them to modern specifications when possible, resulting in the aged Swords of Sangheilios fleet we see today. They've reclaimed the role of heavy carrier, and as far as we've seen are the standard carrier for the Swords of Sanghelios, with at least three of the ships taking part in the Battle of Sunion in 2558. The armament of the Brigantine is more familiar than its silhouette, with one Elcyon pattern super heavy excavation beam. While of course the pattern itself is of nebulous quality, we don't really know much about any specific naval weapons in Halo, this is a glassing beam, which we've come to look for in a Covenant ship. 12 Razu pattern heavy plasma lance batteries. Now if these are anything like the energy projectors found on the Hakarta pattern blockade runner, they lack the range and delicacy of modern variants, but make up for that in raw power, able to be overcharged past the parameters deemed safe or appropriate by the Prophets. Not to mention that these are Plasma Lance batteries, implying there are 12 separate groups of Plasma Lances, not just 12 Plasma Lances. 188 Kasuchu Pattern Plasma Torpedo Silos, that one's fun to say, Kasuchu. This is a larger amount of Plasma Torpedoes than any other Covenant carrier, and maybe it makes sense. With the shorter effective range of the Plasma Lances, perhaps there were more usage cases for torpedoes compared to nowadays. 200 Kiran pattern pulse lasers, nothing out of the ordinary here. Pulse lasers for swatting the flies that get too close makes sense. No Lursu patterns have ever been officially given a name, and all we know about their operational history outside of the merchant tithe fleets is that they served as command ships during the Battle of Sunion. Now it's never explicitly stated, but during that battle, when ships are given the order to report in, we hear the reply, Swords of Sangelios, all ships report in, Havoc on station, 
Hostile on station. Revolution on station. All ships, focus fire on Covenant Air Forces. Send them crashing to our watering grave. Given that there are three brigantines here, and we hear three replies from what are presumably command ships, I don't think it's too much of a leap to assume those are the names of those Lursus. And that is the Lursu Pattern Brigantine Heavy Carrier. The DDS class, or the Ruma Pattern Light Carrier, has never been given an official look, but as I said about the Mako class, Sins of the Prophets has their variation, so I will consider that to be as good as canon until it gets a canon look. If you think that's weird, consider that they made a lot of the canon renders for the ships that you find in the Halo Encyclopedia, so it's fine. The Ruma Pattern Light Carrier is 3,000 meters long, powered by a pinch fusion drive with nano laminate hull and energy shielding, pretty standard stuff. The second shortest of the carriers, it has a crew requirement of a staggering 3,000 to 4,000 personnel. If that sounds like a lot, compared to the 200 needed to crew a CAS class, don't worry, we'll talk about it. These were far rarer than their assault carrier counterparts and were purely meant to supply fleets with extra fire or fighter support. Their inflated crew numbers, probably due to a lack of advanced quality of life improvements afforded to the Siphon or Carol patterns. Those were the most advanced ships. Those were a privilege to find yourself serving on, and while it wasn't a punishment as far as we know to serve on a Ruma pattern, you certainly weren't going to be living it up aboard this thing. These ships were most often captained by new shipmasters who honed their craft and earned promotions to better ships after using these things. The same goes for the pilots who come in fresh and after becoming battle hardened they move on to ships that can make better use of their services. For reference the Ket pattern which is a little over half as long as the Ruma has a crew of 510. Not quite 3000 but far more than the far larger CAS class not to mention that two of the 510 would be Hiragak which are worth what 50 to 100 Sangheili crewmen in terms of operating a ship? Or how about the Varric pattern, with a crew of 1,286 and 70 of them being Kuragak. Imagine if they had to fill that knowledge or dexterity gap with Sangheili or Kigyar. That'd be like 700 menials easy. Anyway, the complement of the Ruma consists of 34 dropships, 200 banshees, and 300 seraphs. Given its role as fleet support, it makes sense that this thing doesn't carry any ground forces, and I think this amount of fighters works just fine. The armament consists of two Ignis pattern plasma lances, the same found on the Ket pattern battlecruiser, seven Morphin pattern plasma cannons, the same found on the Maugen pattern battlecruiser, which was a precursor to the Ket pattern, eight argument pattern plasma torpedo silos also found on the Malgan pattern battlecruiser, and 75 pole pattern pulse lasers for point defense. Patterns that are unique to the Ruma, but just about every Covey ship has pulse lasers on it. But yeah, that is the Ruma pattern. Now, there was one other class of Covenant light carrier that got no name and appeared in Halo Ghosts of Onyx. According to the original Halo Encyclopedia from 2010, re-released in 2011, the thing measured in at 1,455 meters, making it the shortest of the Covenant carriers. We don't know much about this thing except for what details we can squeeze out of the Ghosts of Onyx and its small section in that old encyclopedia. It was a part of the second fleet of homogeneous clarity, the largest Covenant fleet ever seen, which defended high charity and consisted of hundreds of Covenant ships of varying sizes. The chaos of the Great Schism cannot be understated, because in an instant, those hundreds of Covenant ships of various sizes, all in a defensive formation around High Charity, suddenly became potentially hostile vessels to each other based on the species in command of a given ship, not to mention the turmoil within ships that had both brutes and elites on board. Anyway, a ship called Lawgiver was one of them, a light carrier of unknown classification, and it had the pleasure of acting as a shield for the Sangheili aligned cruiser Incorruptible after seeing some brute frigates gets had targeted her. Now we never get any looks at this thing in the canon, but Bacon Shelf of Choke Point Games was kind enough to bequeath upon me the unfinished model for their work in progress Razoon Pattern Light Carrier, which is based upon the canon light carrier that we never get to see. It includes the 13 hangars, which is one of the few things we know about this ship, and it keeps the core design of the CAS class carriers while being noticeably smaller. The three rear repulsor engines, the two part front and back segmented body, the bow even looks like it wants to hook around, like the assault carriers, but it just doesn't have have enough ship to do that. In keeping with the Covenant's aquatic motif, this thing kind of looks like a space whale calf with a CAS as its mom. The more I look at this, the more I like it. It's almost like you wouldn't expect anything to come out of Halo like this. It looks like something from Star Citizen or Elite Dangerous. This looks sick. The unidentified Lawgiver class also has an identical complement to the Ruma pattern, with 300 Seraphs, 200 Banshees, and 34 dropships. This leads me to think that the Ruma pattern was likely meant to be the up-to-date canon version of this carrier, but a few details don't line up, so the Lawgiver's 
class is still tentatively canon unless they say otherwise. I want to get into the Great Schism someday because it's one of the coolest events in the Halo universe and among the most pivotal moments in the lore. The second largest ship in the modern galaxy, excluding the ones built 100,000 years ago. The Shawada Pattern CSO class supercarrier is an absolute behemoth of a ship. Now I just have to mention up top, a lot of people despise this ship because it has the same model as the Carol Pattern but scaled up, and to that I say, sure, but I personally don't care. As someone who likes the Xanar Pattern light cruiser, you may have been able to see that coming. It might have been cooler if it had its own design, but the fact that it looks like a different colored Carol doesn't really change much for me. I prefer this siphon pattern anyways. Anyway, the Shawada Pattern supercarrier is the second largest ship in the entire Covenant Navy that isn't a mobile battle station. Measuring in at 28.96 kilometers, or 18 miles long, and 11.447 kilometers, or 7.11 miles wide, it is also unequivocally the heaviest armed ship in the modern galaxy, as far as we know. Ones built a hundred thousand years ago notwithstanding. Details about the crew and complement of this thing aren't described, but one can assume that if the CAS class carries hundreds of ghosts and wraiths, it isn't too much of a leap to suggest this thing carries at least a thousand ghosts and maybe seven or eight hundred wraiths, dozens of scarabs. It's probable that they carry around some revenants because they appear in the mission tip of the spear, and the only carrier present was Long Knight of Solus, which was a CSO class. Anyway, what we do know about is the armament, and Heavy would be putting it lightly. The CSO class supercarrier's glassing beam is a Lux Pattern Super Heavy Excavation Beam Array. We don't have any details on any of these weapons, but based on the size of the supercarrier, the excavation beam's emitter has a diameter that is like half the length of an entire CAS class. This is the largest glassing beam, easily, and we never really get to see it used because the one CSO we ever see gets blown up before that stage in the invasion. Oh, and remember those Erpion Pattern Super Heavy Plasma Lances that the CAS class has two of, the ones that can destroy a marathon in five seconds, the CSO has 12 of them. I, um, I don't really know what to say about that. Like, that's an entire average human fleet gone at once if the ship is positioned correctly. Good on the UNSC for not even attempting to fight this thing conventionally during the fall of Reach. 20 Ukwa pattern heavy plasma beam arrays. They are really packing on the plasma beams with this thing, and it makes sense. Imagine the size of the pinch fusion reactors on this thing. The secondary reactors would be at least twice the size of the primary reactors on the CAS. Might as well get all the mileage you can. But we're not done yet, as the thing has 80 Luxor pattern heavy plasma beam emitters. This thing is no joke with the plasma beams. It's like a laser light show in combat, I'm sure. Finally, out of the plasma beam zone, this thing has 32 Mictix pattern plasma torpedo silos. Quite a jump down in number from the plasma beams, but not much to say here since we know very little about Covenant weapons in general. If you're unaware, plasma torpedoes are basically the Covenant's answer to UNSC missiles of any kind. I think I already read this in the Brigantine part, but you know, whatever. It makes sense that these things may not need too many. They would be in the center of a large fleet usually, and I'm sure the plasma beams can compensate for whatever would call for torpedo usage. If the beams have too short of a range, the rest of the fleet can cover that. But if the missiles are for point defense, that's why the CSO has 800 Raqqa pattern rapid fire pulse lasers and 490 ferial pattern pulse lasers. They are really getting the mileage out of those reactors, because the main issue with laser weaponry is often energy cost. That should not be a problem for the CSO. We do know that Covenant ships rarely had energy problems. They produced far more than they actually used. As I said, they are not known for efficiency. But yeah, with a combined 1,290 pulse lasers for point defense, it would really suck to try and be a fighter attacking this thing. And that is all we know about the Shawada Pattern Supercarrier. There is one class of Covenant ship larger than the Schwada pattern as far as we know. One supercarrier known as the Sublime Transcendence is the only known member of this class. The Sublime Transcendence was the flagship of the suitably massive Combined Fleet of Righteous Purpose, a fleet rivaling the High Charity Defense Fleet mentioned earlier. The size of the fleet fit the size of the Fleet Master, Zaitan Jarwa Tinri, one of the most well-regarded Sangheili in the entire Covenant, whose presence alone threatened the authority of the Hierarchs. In case you've never heard of this guy, which I'm sure many of you have, have, this guy was the only elite to ever achieve the rank of Imperial Admiral. The effective commander-in-chief of the entire Covenant military stood at 11.6 feet tall, or 3.5 meters. His supercarrier was suitably large, measuring in at 32,490 meters. That's 106,600 feet. 
that's as long as 3.7 Mount Everest stacked on top of each other would be tall. That's ludicrous. And it is all we will know about the ship because we never get to see it do a thing. A group of Hiragak on board tinkering with a human Nova Bomb set it off. Seriously guys? Come on now, what are we doing here? I can't stay mad at you things. Anyway, the majority of the combined fleet of Righteous Purpose was obliterated, Zaitan Jarwatinri was killed, and the planet Sapon Call was rendered uninhabitable, leaving now Kaidan Olabisi Veridai to clean up the mess, with help from our shiny boy Thel. And now, because it is technically a carrier, and it is built from uh, Covenant carriers, I present to you an honorable mention. For too many years, humanity was on the back foot reacting to threats, rather than preventing them. The rest of the galaxy was bigger than us, stronger than us. We were mice hiding in the shadows, hoping the giants would not see us. No more. Humanity is no longer on the defense. We are the giants now. In the years leading up to the created conflict, the rapid rise of the Banished is most emblematic in their new signature ship, the Banished Dreadnought. Built from repurposed and modified Covenant ships, the Dreadnoughts, like their creators, are blunt instruments that represent the faction's aggressive desire to fight effectively, brutally, and in their own way, not like the failed theocracy of years past. The Dreadnoughts aren't meant to be used in any naval context other than barreling straight through or, more likely, straight into an enemy. We've never visibly seen them used against more than one target, but we have circumstantial evidence that suggests that four of them alone may have dealt with a weakened escort fleet supporting the Infinity before moving in for the kill, while suffering no losses themselves. But these ships are more than mere warships. Cortana made it so. Following the destruction of Doisak, the Banished, who were the leading Jirohane faction by far, became the de facto military force of the Jirohane species. The massive ships were constructed from repurposed Covenant ships to better suit the needs of the bestial brutes. Originally, they were meant to serve the purpose of assault support as occupation ships, but now, lacking a homeworld, they are the lifeline for all of Jirohane civilization. There are other brute factions, of course, and they lived on more planets than Doisak alone, no doubt. For example, Venezia has a sizable brute presence, as well as several worlds that the Prophets station them on, and some frontier worlds like Ordendal, Gathved, and Savadak. But the only brute-specific colonies we know of from before the destruction of Doisak were on Woriel and Tish, both of which were moons orbiting Doisak. According to the University of California, if the Earth were to suddenly vanish, Luna, yeah, I'm gonna call it Luna, we're almost in a sci-fi society, we've gotta get that ball rolling eventually, Luna would start to orbit the Sun. I don't know how it would affect temperatures, gravity, etc., but I imagine the orbital radius would change significantly now that the much more massive planet it orbits would be gone. The same probably happened for Woriel, Tish, and Soytrap, although Doisak didn't just poof out of existence, it fucking kersploded. 
Tish was the most prominent manufacturing hub for the Brutes, and their large stock of surface-to-air weaponry came in especially handy when the tidal wave of planet debris began to rain down. The planet is perpetually scavenged by various groups for anything of use. Wariel was not so lucky, as the Banished was unable to achieve any alliance with its inhabitants. The planet was kept in turmoil by territorial disputes and rife with power grabs by entrepreneuring brutes, leading to the vast majority of its population being annihilated by the reign of planetary destruction. Soytrap, while not apparently of any strategic importance, took the brunt of the damage from Doisak. Being the apparent closest moon and with no populace to defend it, the moon was completely obliterated. Anyway, the Banished, with their Dreadnoughts, serves the largest cohesive group of Jirohane in the galaxy. The Dreadnoughts themselves are 2,665 meters long, or 8,743 feet. That puts them at almost half the length of the Infinity, and 165 meters longer than the Spirit of Fire. This thing weighs 127 million tons, and that doesn't surprise me in the least. It looks heavy. I couldn't even lift it. With only one repulsor engine, the Dreadnought was not meant for graceful combat, nor engagement with more maneuverable enemies. The Dreadnought does excel at supporting ground forces, however. With the capability to carry with it 10,000 infantry of varying species and roles, deployable heavy artillery like the massive Gorspite cannons, and hundreds to maybe thousands of drop bases, some of which come equipped with manufacturing or comms equipment letting them serve as forward operating bases, resupply stations, prisons, excavation sites, full-on command centers. Assuming the brutes carry with them some kind of agricultural suite in these ships, and that's a big if, I don't know if they can even eat plants. Then again, gorillas are obligate herbivores, so we really can't know. These dreadnoughts could be almost completely self-sufficient. They have these large and small excavators to clear out mines. They then ship anything they dig up to a manufacturing facility, all of which are on board the ship, and can be deployed anywhere. We see some holograms in the dreadnoughts of UNSC weapons, so they could have just repurposed the UNSC weapons and are now manufacturing more themselves. We can hear the intercom call for uh, power extractors to be deployed. Those would be uh, the things we see in Halo Wars 2. We don't see any of those on Zeta Halo, but presumably there's something similar there. They aren't listed in the complement, but they also carried some amount of Berukaza Workshop siege haulers. These kind of work like uh, UNSC albatrosses, carrying heavy equipment from ship to ground and vice versa. The ships can also deploy hundreds of drop pods, phantoms, ghosts, wraiths, banshees, war skiffs, choppers, and although it isn't stated, probably a few formations of banished fighter bombers, also known as the Devota Workshop Grievers. I'll save the in-depth look at them for another time, but I think it only makes sense for them to have some of these, as the Infinity had space for either 150 broadswords or 150 pelicans, we don't know how many of each, and apparently some sabers and longswords. These fighters could have etched away at the banished dreadnoughts if they had no fighter complement. They could have also had some modified space banshees, like the ones we see the Enduring Conviction deploy at the Ark, who knows. They weren't totally unequipped though to deal with that problem themselves, which brings us to the next section. The naval armament of the Dreadnought is not its greatest strength. It's no slouch, but the occupational capabilities are the real selling point. This thing has six light plasma lances on it, you know I like plasma lances. Light plasma lances are found on various Covenant ships, like the Ket Pattern and one of my favorites, the Ester Pattern Armored Frigate. But unfortunately, I don't believe we ever see them fired. Ten incinerator plasma cannon clusters. Now the fact that there are ten clusters and not ten cannons implies that there could be tens to hundreds of the things, depending on how many a cluster is. But the name incinerator plasma cannons distinguishes them from the ones you'd see on a typical Covenant ship, like these Melusian Pattern heavy plasma cannons on the Suter Pattern. Corvette. If the distinction is anything like the Brute Plasma Rifle, they could have a higher fire rate and more powerful bolts of plasma, which would result in a more rapid overheating rate. 40 Cindir Arrays. Now we have no idea what these are, but based on the amount of them and the name, I think we can probably assume that they're point defense of some kind. When I hear point defense array, I think many lasers. When I hear arrays plural, I hear many groups of many lasers. I did touch on the pros and cons of laser weapons a little bit in my second frigate video, click there to watch that, but these are what I was referring to when I said the dreadnoughts aren't totally hopeless against fighters. 24 plasma torpedo silos. We are well acquainted with these. Plasma torpedoes can rip through most titanium A, and if they hit the right spot, like any missile or torpedo, they could be a one-shot. 70 pulse laser batteries. Mm, you know I like pulse lasers. Again, talked about these in the frigate video a bit. If the ones on the dreadnought are anything like the pulse lasers on the ket pattern, they are also point defense. And the word batteries implies that the number of pulse lasers themselves is the result of 70 times something. It's a heck of a lot of lasers. This would be yet another layer of point defense protecting against fighters and missiles. 
They have at least one stasis beam. This is what was used on Echo 216 at the beginning of Halo Infinite. Sort of like a tractor beam on the Death Star, but instead of drawing you in, the name makes me think that the Dreadnought simply freezes a ship in space or turns off its systems, preventing maneuvering. If it can be used in combat, and if the ships indeed have more than one, that would be a great defense against fighters. Imagine you're a pilot flying your X1, a, a broadsword. You're in combat, you're chasing around a banished griever, and suddenly your controls just stop working. The griever whips around, starts pummeling you with what are apparently car-sized plasma bolts, and the dreadnought bores through you with pulse lasers and cindira rays. Death for you. Also, 343, please make a Halo space combat game. I don't even like fighters, but if you come to be saying what I just described, it doesn't sound like a fun-ass game, you'd be lying. Anyway, the most interesting yet mysterious inclusion on the Dreadnought's arsenal is the Super Heavy Grav Impact Driver, which, while it has no description anywhere, sounds a whole lot like the battering ram on the front of the Dreadnought is a giant, million-ton gravity hammer. That would explain why the Dreadnought's ramming the Infinity would result in this, rather than this. It could also explain this, like, tear down the front of the ram, like the blast from the gravity component has to be directed forward. It would make a lot of sense, too. I talked about Gravitics in... or oh, that video's not out yet. I talk about Gravitics in an upcoming video on Covenant Ballistic Weapons. It's the science in Halo behind what the gravity hammers do, how UNSC ships float, how the gravity plates allow them to walk around on ships with no gravity. It's even the source of some Forerunner ship's propulsion. But the Brutes have perfected using that Gravitics tech in all sorts of offensive ways, more so than any other species. Not just the hammers, but the firing mechanisms for spikers, the hammer bayonet on that upcoming shotgun thing. I can't show you the video of that leak or my channel will get a strike. Point is, it would be incredibly on brand for the Banished to put a giant gravity ram on their ship, especially one that lacks much long-range capability. And if Halo ships were Pokemon, this attack would be super effective. That's fucking stupid. Anyway, that's what I think it is. For a new segment I've never done in a breakdown, I want to suss out the weaknesses in the design of the Dreadnought. Firstly, only having one repulsor drive and presumably maneuvering with Gravitics makes me doubt the maneuverability of this ship. The Infinity is one chunky target, so ramming it would probably not be such a tall task, but if something fast and powerful like the Sanghealy Blockade Runner, which I've also done a breakdown for, were to appear, they would constitute a serious threat. Other maneuverable ships like a Strident class as well, the shields would make it a hard fight. Possibly some kind of upgraded halberd like we've talked about in the past, that would be good too. Even a normal halberd would be too small for them to effectively ram, because a halberd is definitely faster than a Dreadnought. In a situation where you can see the Dreadnoughts coming, some Anlaces or Mulsans would probably be great. In the second Frigate video, I talked about the Helios Capital Scale Laser. That would probably be extremely long range, as well as the massive pulse lasers on that thing. Same goes for the Bright Lance on the Mulsan. The last, I say the very last situation you want to be in, is one where they get the drop on you in close range, and all you have as an escort is seven Mulsans. Ships that would excel at a long range combat situation, but lack significant point defense or shielding or armor. So the Infinity got dealt a bad hand. A theory I've started to take as canon is that the Infinity just beat a Guardian in a fight, which appears to be the case based on the fact that a dead Guardian is off in the distance. Who knows what that battle could have been like. The Infinity could have had all ten of its stridents, deployed them, and lost them all to the Guardian. Not to mention the damage done to her. While the portrayal of it isn't very narratively satisfying, it makes total sense. But these things are the Banished's answer to the Spirit of Fire, and with them acting as the last functional bastion of Jirohane culture, they also work as Banished Infinities. I really like them, and I love the aesthetic and general vibe of the Banished, but that's all I've got for now. There are a lot of known Covenant carriers. Almost all of them are going to be CAS class carriers, so let's start with the others. There are a couple we have no idea the pattern of, such as the ship Pledge of Holiness. Now, this was captained by the Prophet of Inner Conviction, who, like all prophets, has an ironic name because he was an early doubter of the Great Journey. The actual shipmaster in command was an elite, Commander Truk Tangil. We don't really know anything about the ship, although Halo Broken Circle, the book it appears in, takes place partly in 851 BCE, so it could be an likely is a brigantine or something similar. That's just my guess. Although the ship does engage stealth at one point. Brigantines are never stated to have stealth capability, but the Hakar top pattern blockade runner does. Ronner? And those were prominent at the same time in history. 
The Hikarta's stealth is achieved through sensor jamming and a deployment of drones, rather than the modern active camo we see, so perhaps it was something like that. The other unknown ship is called Splendid Intention. Had to go through the Wayback Machine for this one, as this is what the Halo Waypoint article looks like. The carrier was taken down by a detachment of Spartan 2s, we don't know how specifically, and its detritus crashed into the oceans of Beta Gabriel, a human colony. The carrier was important because it apparently carried within it plans for new weapon systems that were, quote, so powerful it would render their already cruel orbital weapons obsolete. Unfortunately, the research team within Fathom Station sent to recover the supposed blueprints found nothing, and were all killed when the carrier shifted underwater, causing debris to crush the facility. Ah! Ah! The Ascendant Justice is the only known Ruma Pattern light carrier, which I talked about at length somewhere in my hour-long Frigates of the UNSC video. If you're wondering why a Covenant ship would have appeared in a video with a name like that, parts of the Ascendant Justice were used by Blue Team to upgrade the Gettysburg, a Paris-class frigate. The Ascendant Justice was part of the fleet of Particular Justice during the assault on Reach, and after the Battle of Installation 04, it was boarded by John 117, Avery Johnson, Cortana, a pair of Marines, and an Oni Lieutenant. This was a weird ship. It had an AI on board, which wasn't common for the Covenant, an unusually low amount of personnel, and, <sighs> and apparently an inordinate amount of Hurigok. During the Battle of Installation 04 itself, though, the Ascendant Justice was used in tandem with the Ket Pattern Truth and Reconciliation as a base of operations for the Prophet of Stewardship. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the Prophet would repeatedly undermine Thel Vatami's authority. Normally, this would be fine, as San Shayum almost unanimously hold higher station than Sankili, but Thel was a supreme commander. This is the second highest rank a member of the Covenant military could hold, second only to Imperial Admiral. And Thel was the best supreme commander we know of, personally responsible for the fall of seven human planets and one billion human casualties. Needless to say, when Thel Vatami went to confront the Prophet for gross misallocation of their already thin resources, the Prophet's forces simply acknowledged the supreme commander's authority and ignore the San Shayum's order to arrest him. Thel really rolled up, and the Prophet said, Arrest that man! Captain, arrest him! There's more to the ship story that you can find in The Fall of Reach, the oldest Halo book out there. Moving on. On July 24th, 2552, the fleet of Valiant Prudence detected Forerunner artifacts in the Eridanus system. Led by another Supreme Commander, Ro Barudami, who was actually searching for Maithrilian, the Forerunner capital. Interesting detail there. Barudami was a much better commander than the Prophet of Regret, so he was actually careful on approach to the system, even though he was still surprised to find a massive human fleet orbiting Reach. Keeping the bulk of the fleet cloaked and at a distance, he sent in small forces led by zealots to take out human sensors and communication devices like Visegrad Relay, as we see in the beginning of Halo Reach. This both allowed for a huge force to sneak onto the planet and prevented Reach from contacting other colonies for help. The Epsilon Eridani fleet would be all the help she had. The fleet of Valiant Prudence itself consisted of 36 suitor pattern corvettes, so the fleet was somewhat prepared for a large-scale planetary assault, as that is those corvettes' specialty. 13 Ket pattern battlecruisers, good all-rounders that would be able to keep the flagship safe pretty well, especially when used in tandem with the three Varric pattern heavy cruisers also present, those being some of the most powerful ships in the entire Covenant in themselves. All of which, save for a few suitor patterns, would be escorting the fleet's flagship, the Long Knight of Solus, a CSO-class supercarrier. If it weren't for the quick thinking of Noble 2, Cat B320, the Long Knight of Solus probably would have gone onto glass reach before the majority of the successful evacuations. Thankfully, it was destroyed during Operation Uppercut by George and Spartan B312. Hang on, hang on, I just realized I've never talked about Noble 6 on this channel. Like, ever. What? Anyway, the operation, which I'm sure you understand by now, was twofold. Operation Left Jab would distract the bulk of the fleet, while Operation Uppercut entailed using the UNSC Savannah Slipspace Drive as a makeshift payload, which would be carried aboard the suitor pattern Ardent Prayer when its communications were jammed. A squadron of FSS-1000 Sabres would be used to take out the ship's fighter complement and then board the corvette and take out the ship's crew. The ship would then be set on an autopiloted refueling run to the CSO-class supercarrier, at which point the slipspace drive would be overloaded and kaboom. Barudami, who was already stressed out because of how poorly he had been doing in the battle, was presumably obliterated. That's George's kill, everybody. George got the kill on the Supreme Commander and presumably like 20,000 other cubbies minimum. The lead up to the Battle of Reach actually has a lot more details to it than I thought. Maybe I'll just do a video someday detailing the exact goings on in chronological detail. Let me know what you think. Purveyor of Virtue was a CAS class of that unidentified variety we mentioned earlier and has only been seen once. For whatever reason, the Covenant Remnant faction 
in control of this ship, was seeking to capture the human power and fuel processing station on high power, the Halo Infinite Big Team Battle Map. It was met with resistance only from the Panama, a Mulsanne-class frigate. The carrier didn't fire out of fear of destroying the very plant it was sent to capture, but I suspect it probably is deploying some ground forces or phantoms to make their way over. We'll probably never know, because high power is stuck in a time loop. Not really, but like, you know what I mean. In 2551, the Enduring Conviction, a siphon pattern assault carrier, was responsible for the destruction of an unspecified number of human ships, before it was captured by Atriox and the Banished. This is the same carrier that would take part in the second battle for the Ark against the Spirit of Fire. It was actually captained by Let Valir, who was a really good shipmaster despite his general bitch demeanor. Anyway, Atriox allowed himself and some of his warlords to be captured by a Covenant Remnant group of mercenaries, afterward taking control of the ship from the inside because because come on now guys, this is Atriox, it's kind of hard to imagine him losing. Anyway, it would dominate the skies and the forces it deployed would completely obliterate the Oni personnel at the Henry Lamb Research Outpost, who were completely cut off from any form of UNSC reinforcements after Cortana shut down the Ark Portal. The ship would meet its end after Germa, Spart- Germa. The ship would meet its end after Jerome boarded the ship and inserted Isabel into the system, who then fired the ship's Infernus pattern super heavy excavation beam into the Ark, triggering its automated defense system, which directed thousands of sentinels to consider the carrier an enemy combatant. Day of Jubilation was another siphon pattern assault carrier, this one present for the first half of the Battle of Earth in 2552. It was the victim of Master Chief giving the Covenant back their bomb, but hey, at least it got one more kill off, a kill that will live on in eternity, in the form of me playing it every single time I bring up plasma lances. And the final siphon pattern assault carrier is the Solemn Penance, flagship of the Fleet of Sacred Consecration, and for some reason, the High Prophet of Regret's ship. I say some reason because I would have assumed all the hierarchs would make use of Carol patterns instead. I know Regret uses a siphon because well, it was just the design for assault carriers when Halo 2 came out, but I like to think it was because he was kinda... petulant. Like, of all the hierarchs, Regret was the most impatient, angry, violent, maybe he just deserved worse things. Mercy didn't seem to demand much, he just floated next to Truth, and Truth had all the real power. We see Regret leave the safety of High Charity the moment the Ark Portal is found. He doesn't even tell Mercy or Truth, he doesn't check the soul system for human presence, so maybe he just had a Carol pattern and was just not patient patient enough to wait for it. Most of the prophets have names that are ironic to their personality. I think many of you already know, Truth was a chronic liar, Mercy died from a Mercy killing, perhaps not waiting for his Carol pattern was just one more decision on the pile that Lad Moran would come to Prophet of Regret. <clears throat> Thank you. Resplendent Fervor was commanded by Supreme Commander and Power Rangers villain Luro Taralami, who was responsible for the Covenant victory at the Battle of Miradem, the results of which were one glassed Miradem and one captured cryostasis Dr. Halsey. Yes, if you didn't know, Halo Legends The Package is 100% canon. Now, some might be like, eh, it's an exaggerated depiction of canon events, but I say boo, that's boring. It happened exactly as is shown in the animation because I find it hilarious. Anyway, so this elite, Thel, Ladami, he somehow realized that Dr. Halsey was important, based on Sheila 065's willingness to sacrifice herself for her. Yes, Sheila 065, a Spartan 2 who we never got to see, was killed by this elite major anime character off screen. God damn it, I love this short. Anyway, the entire plot of the package was getting Halsey back, Operation Warm Blanket it was called, and we get to see Resplendent Fervor split into two ships, because Lero Taralami was a crazy person who liked to psychologically torment his men, especially this one Major. Wait, okay, think about this. Major Thelotomy is not a high-ranking individual. He outranks elite miners and thrall species alone. He was disgraced disgraced because he was the sole survivor of a military maneuver against a group of humans containing a Spartan. His mission, which was a success, still dishonored him. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fu- But I'll always be there when you need Don't me. Don't make a girl a promise if you know you can't keep it. Yeah, um, I'm gonna have to ask you just really, really quickly to just to cool it and stop what you're doing. He was then summoned to the bridge so that Taralami could verbally berate him for like 15 minutes, only to be ordered to fight Master Chief in a one-on-one. -on -one. He can block bullets, I guess and Chief forgot how to aim down at his legs for a moment. Latami does extremely well and was about to, and uh, follow me here, he was about to kill Master Chief, only for Taralami 
to tractor beam him into the bow of the ship while talking shit. Because the best idea he had to win the day was to allow the humans to complete their objectives and then run away, leaving them in an abandoned bottom half of a CAS class that has plenty of escape shuttles on board. How the hell did this guy make Supreme Commander? He does not care about winning, he's just an asshole. It is funny though. Either due to the expense of making them, the fact they were only made of Covenant scraps, or the fact that the design is quite new, they don't have many known ships of the line. The banished dreadnoughts are all named after ghosts or mythological entities of Jurulhane culture, predating the Covenant and definitely predating the brute's induction into the hegemony. The dreadnoughts Ghost of Tia Kolo and Ghost of Lodan were present for the Battle of Zeta Halo, alongside the most famous of the line, Ghost of Gabraken. This was the ship infiltrated by Chief six months after the destruction of the Infinity, promptly destroyed. While Eshram's speeches usually carry some weight, he was full of bluster this time when he said that the destruction of the ship matters not. It would have carried thousands of troops, hundreds of pieces of equipment and arms and armor, a sizable chunk of the banished forces at Zeta Halo just gone. And there are at least some Strident class frigates and Autumn class cruisers still at Earth, disabled, maybe not destroyed, along with who knows how many other ships still out there in the colonies. There's also the Arbiter's forces at Sanghelios, the Spirit of Fire, and more Spartans than we can count. With the loss of enduring conviction at the Ark, this is a significant blow to the Banished Navy. I'm sure there are plenty more Banished out there. We don't see any intrusion corvettes, Drakar warships, or even Carve escort ships, which are said to be the backbone of the Banished Navy. Now, the Infinity was taken out by four Dreadnoughts, and we know three of them were Gabraken, Tia Kolo and Lodan. We know of three others, Ghost of Malkadir, Ghost of Barillon, and Ghost of Gafolos. They could be any of these, but uh, they're, it's not explicitly stated. Including this one that hangs over Chief throughout the entire game, the one responsible for all of the drop pods we see, I'm sure. But there could still be a sizable banished force out there. The Seeker of Truth was a flagship in the fleet of Particular Justice, commanded by Thel Vadimi during the Fall of Reach and the Battle of Installation 04. Now, I think this is a Carol pattern, but we don't get to see its top side in the one cutscene we know is depicting this ship specifically. There is a shot of a Carol pattern in a later terminal in Halo 2, but we don't know if this is the same ship. Actually, wait, it's not like they would make two separate models to use in the terminals and be like, this one's a Siphon, this one's a Carol. Yeah, you know, I com I'm comfortable saying the Seeker of Truth is probably a Carol pattern. I don't see why one wouldn't be given to the most accomplished supreme commander in the Covenant, unless they were Luro Taralami. I wouldn't trust that guy to captain a dinghy. He'd probably take out a comically large needle and shove it into the back of the boat so that it goes faster. The Breath of Annihilation, awesome name, was one of the two assault carriers to be a part of Jewel Emdama's Covenant, alongside the Song of Retribution. The Song of Retribution was Jewel's flagship, in fact, present when the Forward Unto Dawn's Hulk was discovered at the beginning of the First Battle of Requiem. It, the remains of the Forward Unto Dawn, and the entire fleet consisting mostly of CRS class light cruisers were all pulled into Requiem, the Infinity arriving later. The reason the Infinity was never engaged by the carrier is probably just speculation that Jewel had a single CAS and a bunch of Xanars and was more than content to explore Requiem while Captain Del Rio was primarily focused on leaving. This allowed for Jewel to occupy the planet until the Infinity and her fully stocked frigate fleet could return six months later to dislodge the remnant group from the world, only for Jewel to flee with the Song of Retribution and his fleet, while Requiem was flung into the sun. With half of the Janus Key, Jewel would later have the Song of Retribution take part in the Battle of Actus IV alongside the Breath of Annihilation, which would sustain heavy damage in a slugfest with the Infinity. I just stepped back and looked at all this for a moment. There's a lot of Halo lore. Anyway, all that Actus IV and Absolute Record stuff can be saved for another day. And yes, I saved her for last. Easily the most famous and one of the most accomplished CAS class assault carriers, captained by fan favorite and all-around sick chap Artis Vadum. The Shadow of Intent is a Carol pattern assault carrier designed by the Prophet of Expediency, with help from the Vice Minister of Sacral Assembly. Knowing the naming convention, the Prophet of Expediency was probably really slow, and the Vice Minister of Sacral Assembly probably built something not sacred, I don't know. The Shadow of Intent also has some upgrades as the single most powerful ship in the Swords of Sanghelios fleet. Shiny Boy Thel told the Swords Hiragok to make any improvements they wanted to the vessel, and the engineers got to work outfitting it with runic plating. Lattice is a forerunner composite, that's this stuff here. This probably gives the ship some unprecedented defense stats, and came with the added benefit of, and this is straight out of the mouth of Halo Warfleet, new energy conduits of unknown purpose. That is to say, even the Swords of Sanghelios don't really know what the Hiragok did 
mid to the ship. The back bit of the Shadow of Intent is known as the Nave of the Creators, a huge shrine to the Forerunners. Arbiter allows this because while most of the swords seem to have abandoned the Old Faith, the proposed Sanghili Concert of Worlds would be a secular government, and the Arbiter still believes in religious freedom which is Pog. The ship likely took part in innumerable battles during the Human Covenant War, but the earliest we know of is the Battle of Installation 05. During the Great Schism, the Shadow of Intent returned to High Charity and partially glassed the internal city in an attempt to slow or halt the spread of the Flood within. The Sanghelia-aligned ships at High Charity would become the Fleet of Retribution and form a blockade preventing the escape of any ships whatsoever, lest the Flood escape out into the galaxy and bring an end to life as we know it. One ship managed to break through the formation, a ket pattern battlecruiser called indulgence of conviction, and jumped to Earth, followed close behind by a portion of the Fleet of Retribution, including the Shadow of Intent. This portion of the fleet would go on to Glass Void to prevent the Flood from spreading. Vadum personally warned humans to flee the sector and let the elites handle the infection, after which Lord Hood and Miranda Keys would be invited onto the ship to discuss their next move, with the Forward Under Dawn joining the Fleet of Retribution at the Ark. It's kinda funny, the Battle of Installation 00 in space consisted of hella Ket pattern battlecruisers, at least three Carol pattern assault carriers, and a Varric pattern heavy cruiser, and in the midst of all this was one Karin class frigate. Miranda really wasn't kidding when she said, After Truth was killed and the war was over, the Shadow of Intent would hover nearby while the Arbiter attended the memorial ceremony for all the casualties of the war. One billion of which he was personally responsible for, but I forgive him, I guess. Look, I know elites have different ideas about honor and stuff, but just, just for lack of a better comparison, right? World War II ends. America holds a ceremony in honor of all the people who died. Heinrich Himmler attends. It's kind of weird, right? I know elites don't view it that way. They're like, ah, oh, war is war, and it's actually good, actually. War is good, and the fact that I honor you guys for fighting good is good. But, you know, it's kind of weird. And I appreciate the gesture with in mind, like, how elites think about this kind of thing, but some guy with hella PTSD from the war that just ended would not appreciate seeing this. He's just attending the service, and his buddy nudges him, hey, Brian. Is that what I think it is? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. If Locke was here, he must have been fucking seething. Anyway, as a part of the Swords of Sanghelios, Artas and the Shadow of Intent would be given a very specific mission, one that it carries out to this day within the Halo universe. Hunt down the prophets. You fucked up my face. Ah! Let's talk about Artas's crew, shall we? His right hand, Blademaster Vulsaran, is an old man and a master swordsman. While somewhat attached to his traditional ways, his insight has been invaluable to the shipmaster. Tol Juran is a scion and the sole surviving daughter of House Juran. She would go on to face the prelate Tembatek in combat with an energy lance alongside Artes Vadum and Stolt. Oh, did I forget to mention? Stolt is an Ungoy Ranger commander who stands between 6'4 and 7'5 based on Sanghealy averages. I use that metric because Stolt is described as having stature reaching most Sanghealy shoulders. At one point during the war, the Grunt, a Grunt, would go on to grievously wound a Spartan in combat, and has since gone on to best every Sanghili who dares challenge him in a duel, because he has absolutely pendulous balls. He leads Sanghili rangers into battle, and Artas at times consults him for strategic advice. He later knocks out a prelate with a punch because he's awesome. Bring Stolt back, please. Write something with Stolt in it, or, or better yet, give him an official comic book in the Bloodlines art style. That right there, that would be perfection. Anyway, the crew would accompany Artas in their hunt for the prophets, and along the way, the shipmaster would actually come to the conclusion that perhaps not all prophets are bad. That is to say that some Sanshayum are less deserving of violent retribution than others. Not Das Basvad though. If you know, you know. Artas, kill that guy, please. Tembatek, for example, had been exploited from birth and lied to just the same as the elites regarding the Great Journey, and sacrificed himself to destroy a destructive superweapon he helped create, with his last thoughts being of his late wife and child. This is all from the short story Shadow of Intent, by the way. Please go read it. It's one of the best Halo stories out there. It made me cry for a fucking prophet. Anyway, Artas would return to the Arbiter one more time as far as we know, just to inform Arby of the goings-on, and tell him, hey, perhaps all Sanshayum aren't bad, to which Arbiter replied,
replies, yeah, I figured. What are you, racist? Okay, he didn't say that. In Halo Outcasts, we learn that the Shadow of Intent is still out there hunting prophets seven years later, and the Arbiter wanted to recall the ship for the operation carried out in this book. In my Sword Frigate video, I expressed relief that he did not, because the ship probably would have been destroyed by the Divine Hand, which is a whole other story. God, Halo's got a lot of lore. I like the idea that Cortana sends her broadcast to the galaxy telling everyone to lay down their weapons, but Artas is just like, nah, I think I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. Anyways, yeah, that's the Shadow of Intent. And that is all of the Carriers of the Covenant. I hope you enjoyed that. It took a long, long time, and I have another job now too, so not much time to work on videos. I don't know what's next, but it will probably be a video, as it's YouTube, and uh... You know, that's what is. What am I doing? Mayhaps subscribe to my channel, Mark the Crawler, as over the course of 2024, I plan on releasing much more content over there. I've got to break out of my Halo only cocoon someday. I'm a beautiful, handsome, sexy butterfly who must spread their wings. Don't worry, I'll continue to make Halo content for as long as I like Halo. And I have liked Halo for the past. 19 years, so the chances are high that the trend will continue. I just have to be creative and stuff to make sure my brain doesn't melt under the heat of intense ADHD energy. Oh yeah, I got diagnosed with ADHD, which I find to be pretty cool, because now I'm not just the second best mark on YouTube, I'm the second best mark on YouTube with ADHD. I might have a podcast as well in some time in the future, so it might be something to... look forward to? I don't know, it's something to be aware of in our universe that we share. Alright, ta-ta. See you later. I bid you adieu. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.